This morning is the conclusion of a four-week series um, called The Relational Risky God. And today's kind of, I've been doing this the whole time, I hope, but today's kind of the so what. The so what message, right? This is great, but how does this translate to me? And we've been looking at what God is really like and how different God is than the Greek God version that has kind of swayed the church for literally 2,500 years. And it's the idea that God in the story is both predetermined and yet allows for flexibility all at the same time. God is both outside time. He has a sovereign will. He is omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing. And yet, simultaneously, he has the ability to be inside time and take great relational, emotional. See, Rhonda? Shh, Brian, we're going to have to move her to the back. Risk. God, remember after Adam's sin, in only the third chapter of the entire Bible, God goes looking for him, looking for him. And he says, where are you? And what are you doing out here? The omniscient one, the sovereign, sets his knowing aside to be in the moment with Adam. It's a, it's a lot like when I'm with my grandkids. They're all three and under. And I'm in the room with them it's quite predictable what they will do. That's not quite omniscient, but it's my own version of it. But I never just say, well, Bodie, there's no point in doing all this because I already know the next 10 things you're going to do. I never say that. I step in, I get on the floor, and I allow the creativity of my three-year-old grandson or my one-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter or my 10-month-old grandson play out their life and enjoy the freedom in that. Or put another way, God is both strategically rigid and tactically flexible. And it's, I think, fundamental in properly understanding the story and thus understanding the God that we have come to know and how he relates with us. And it's unfortunate the church has adopted a very imbalanced approach to just how predetermined our life is. And as we said before, this is rooted in Greek philosophy. It's a th theology that permeated the church with the early Greek philosophers like Plato and Socrates. And it's holding to the idea or the concept that God is one rather than to the essence that God is a trinity of oneness. This is a huge difference. I personally now believe that many of the decisions that are made by God and us are actually quite undetermined and quite flexible. I believe that much of the future, as far as our lives are concerned, is undetermined. This God, unthwarted in his commitment and in his ability to return humanity back to its intended grandeur and connection within union within the Trinity, stands ready to hear our laments and our cries and our longings to get on the floor with us, as it were longing to interact with his covenant partners and the ruling of his covenant kingdom for the restoration of a broken, broken place. This should greatly change how we view God. This should greatly change how we view ourselves. And then it should greatly change how we come in union with God. And that's the three pieces that I want to kind of finish with this morning. And then when I'm finished... I'm going to see if you have anything to process or question, and we'll, we'll give you a few minutes to ask anything that maybe didn't sit right, is confusing, um, you just want to process out loud. So first, how does this inform us about God? Secondly, what is, how does this inform us about ourselves? And then finally, how does this inform our connection within the Trinity? So first, how this informs us about God. It informs our hearts and minds in several ways. I'm just going to mention three this morning. First of all, a much greater sense of just how sovereign God is. We finished last week with the story of Hezekiah. You remember the story, <clears throat> 2 Kings 20, I believe it is. 
Isaiah the prophet gets sent by God, go tell Hezekiah, you're going to die. So Hezekiah goes with the lovely message, goes into the palace, goes into the palace room and sits with Hezekiah and says, put your, put your life in order, finish writing out your trust because you're, you're, you're done. And he's not, God, God's not mad. Hezekiah's been a fantastic guy. It's just done. And Isaiah leaves the room and he's still in the palace walking through the corridors and, and Hezekiah bows and prays. And it doesn't say what he prays, but we know what he prays because instantly before Isaiah the prophet has left the building, God says, you better go back because I've changed my mind. And Isaiah, excuse me, Hezekiah the king gets 15 years added to his life. 15 years added to his life. Can you even imagine the number of decisions and choices and changes God had to incorporate with 15 years more of one person's living? Somehow God allows a ton of decisions by Hezekiah, and he still ends up where he wants to end up exactly on the day he does when he brings Jesus. Researchers at Cornell University estimate we make 226.7 decisions a day on food alone. Now, I can tell you that is inaccurate. I am at least twice that. I never stop thinking of food. I'm thinking of food right now. And as your level of responsibility increases, so does the weight of your choices that you have to make. It's estimated that the average adult male, or excuse me, or female, makes about 35,000 remotely conscious decisions each day. 35,000. Each decision, of course, carries certain consequences, and with it, both good and bad. That means in the 15 years God added to King Hezekiah's life, on Hezekiah's request, by the way, he added over 178 million decisions by Hezekiah that had impact and consequence. And he was the king, no less. And as I shared last week, his son Manasseh starts to reign when he's 12. Three years into his life extension, Manasseh is born. And Manasseh is a horrible person, although he repents at the very last minute. He's the worst king Judah in the south ever had. And he reigned the longest of any king, which I'm not sure why God allowed that either. 55 years of horrible decisions by his son, only because... God extended the life of Hezekiah. If you can wrap your head around that, please help me. This requires great flexibility and shift on God's part. Yet he, his overall goal to restore humanity was never affected somehow by 178 million more decisions by one particular person. Rigidly strategic, but tactically flexible. That's sovereignty. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God that we were almost quieted by that we just sang to. You see, if God has everything predetermined, and no matter what we do, he just plows ahead, I suppose that's impressive but that would make him nothing more than a puppeteer. Ah, but if God accounts for every thought we have, valuing each movement within our hearts and minds and still never takes his hand off the steering wheel of salvation and restoration, that is a massive God. Greg and I were just talking about this. We have this tendency to be frustrated when God steps outside of our box. Isn't it true? We love to have the lines around God so we can define him, but God is not definable. God is explainable sometimes, but God is not to be defined. This is sovereign. Second of all, This this series informs us that he never does anything that is not internally motivated for the other. 
His DNA is love. That's what it says in 1 John. That's his is. We talked about this. God never acts not out of relational love. So when life goes south, loss of health, loss of job, loss of finances, loss of relationships, loss of clarity, loss of direction, it is not because God has suddenly distanced himself from you. Rather, life is ugly. The world is fallen. The prince of darkness rules this earth. And here's the one we just added in the last three weeks. People for relational freedom's sake get to make up their own mind, which, by the way, can adversely affect you. All of this comes into play in your life. So if God doesn't do what we want at the exact timing we want, in the exact way we want, there is something else going on. But we know what it is not. It is not that he's unloving. Something else is in play. As I just mentioned, other people are making decisions that affect you. What you may be seeking may not actually be good for you in the moment or in somebody else's life around you. Or here's an ad for you. Perhaps even this difficulty is necessary for God to accomplish the grand plan of saving humanity. See, here it is. There is possibly, I'm not saying it's always, there's a whole list of things of why life doesn't work. But there's a possibility that there's something so important in the part you are playing, in your struggle, God will not immediately remedy your problem. In my personal opinion and from my understanding of the story, there's really one main reason God is rigid. And that is saving humanity and bringing us back into oneness with them, Father, Son, and Spirit. So think about that. If God doesn't immediately or ever solve your issue, there's a possibility. It might be because you and what you are going through are so integral to the restoration of humanity, he cannot do it. That's mind-blowing. That's called meaning. Does it fix your problem? No. Does it elevate your significance in the moment? Oh my gosh, yes. You see, there are momentary times when God takes us from the corner of the stage and he moves us to the middle. He highlights our life through our suffering to make him known to fix what is outside these walls. And that you could be a part of that. Does it hurt? It's horrible. <laughs> Remember, though, in the midst of that, he is the one that, although outside time, places himself also inside time to feel and hurt with you. He is on the floor with you. He is not an uncaring chess player sacrificing a pawn on the board to simply turn the queen over, but instead a loving father, knowing that his kids have to endure difficulty to restore humanity. See, as father, he's a father whose heart breaks at the pain and hurt his kids feel, but stays the course because he sees and is committed to the rescue of humanity. It raises our significance greatly. Does it change in any way God's essence? Absolutely not. Can you imagine for a moment being God who only responds with love and otherness not being able to change your situation because it is so important. That is caring. And finally, how does this inform us about God? He is way more into us and our lives than we give him credit. Rhonda prayed this before the service this morning when we met. It just really impacted me. 
God, you are so much more, she prayed, excited about this morning than we are. You are so much more excited about us than we are. You're so much more looking forward to this morning's service than even we are. See, he loves our freedom. He loves our will and our decisions and our movement like any good parent would. He loves watching us rally around one another and love one another and pray for one another and serve one another. He loves watching us flourish and create and try and fail because he doesn't care because there is no failure. Go ahead, take a lump of clay, put it on the wheel, start squeezing. If it all mushes off to the side, he'll laugh and he'll say, grab another clump. Let's try it again. Why? Because he loves our freedom and creativity. He loves our lives. When we prayed for Diane Copeland two weeks ago upstairs with her wrist, before we, before we prayed, she said, I want you all to know something. There were like 15 of us upstairs. She said, I feel so loved. What a powerful, we hadn't even prayed yet. By the way, a bunch of us have been praying already, but we hadn't prayed in that moment. And she said, I want you to know I feel so loved and supported. God is into us. Well, how does this inform us about ourselves? Well, I think this is very obvious. First of all, our decisions actually matter. Now, when I say that, there's two kinds of people here, and so let me clarify for the, for the kind that I, that I really, really relate with. This is not meant to create pressure on you. Oh, my gosh. I thought my decisions mattered too much already. Now they really matter. Like, oh, I can't make the wrong choice. This is not creating pressure. This is creating more significance. We, of course, do not work our way into God's graces. God graces us. Jesus' blood, if we placed our faith in him for one split second, makes us pure and holy and innocent before God. His blood, not our behavior, not our responses, not our ability to make the perfect decision, make us perfect in our union with the three of them. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's just a gift. So then when we say our decisions matter, it isn't about pressure to perform for God, but rather the freedom to live and the significance we carry as God's anointed priests and family. When we move forward in faith under God's prompting, we are truly participating in his strategic plan to restore all of life. When we give our life to Christ, it says the Spirit of God, a third of the Trinity, comes within us. And when we walk outside these doors, every foot we take, every step we take, we take on behalf of the Trinity. And we are walking, literally, we are stomping on darkness with the power of God resting on us. When we give a cup of cold water in his name, we are rewarded because we are acting out of the essence of our Trinity-given DNA, which is not a word, but I'm going to make it a word today, otherliness. I've added it now in my word check. It's now a word. Remember, he doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. Second, our freedom is paramount to God. He is not riddling us with rules now. He is freeing us to live. That's why Paul wrote what he wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 10. All things now are lawful, but not all things are helpful or profitable. All things, he says, are lawful but not everything builds up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. There's two things about those verses that I think are fascinating. First of all, he says, you're free. You are totally free. So your decisions, and I want you to hear this, this is actually a biblical thing here. This is out of the Bible. Your decisions are not really about right and wrong anymore, if you know Jesus. Your decisions are not about, this is gonna rankle some people, 
sin anymore. There are people that come here every now and then, and it's happened twice in the last five years, and they literally come to me and they say, you don't talk about sin enough. And that's what I think, you're not going to last here. Because my sin has been dealt with on the cross by the blood of Jesus. And if all I do is look backwards while I'm walking that way, I'm going to bump into every tree there is. I am pure and holy and innocent. I am a child of the risen king. Do you hear that? Can you say that? Our life is not about sin anymore. Our life is about life, about what is helpful and profitable, what befits our grandeur, what fits our other's oriented DNA, which, by the way, is the second piece of this. That's why the, the thing says all things are lawful, not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all the things build up. And then the ne- very next verse is, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. See, if you make your life about you, you will cave in. It is not who you are. No wonder the world's a mess. No wonder anxiety and depression and suicide are choking our country, and especially our young people. The equation is so simple. The Trinity serves and loves us. Remember I said this a few weeks ago. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, that was not a one-off. The Trinity is washing your feet right now right? They are at your feet. (laughs) Father, Son, and Spirit, the Great One, at your feet, washing your feet and serving you. And when you realize that, you feel that deeply until you're full up, full up, and then we overflow into others. That's how life works. When we make life about ourselves, we suffocate under the weight of acting against our own God-given DNA. Third, and man, is this one obvious, our prayers actually matter. I'm not going to spend hardly any time on this because I'm going to teach a series on this in July. But like Hezekiah, God listens to you. He might not always go with our plan in the moment, but the ultimate desire of God is for you. Do you hear that? That'll be a big chunk of a sermon that I just wrote yesterday, by the way. His ultimate will, his strategic will is for our health and our vitality and our prosperity. We are just caught up in a cosmic war temporarily between God and darkness. And sometimes his immediate will is beyond our complete grasp. In fact, I would argue most of the time his immediate will is beyond my grasp. But I I do not have to question his ultimate will. His ultimate will is for my health and my vitality as well as yours. He never acts not out of love for you. And then finally, how does this inform our connection then with the Trinity? And this is another one This is almost the introduction to this four-week series I'll be doing in July. So I'll be brief, but just two things. First of all, God has called us into relationship with them. This has required great risk on his part. As this includes the ability to make decisions and choices that have impact and consequences consequences, including the ability to completely reject him. All of us know what we can be like. We can get super moved and charged up on a Sunday morning. And then by around lunch on Monday, we realize he hasn't even entered into our thoughts. And yet God, all the while, is wooing us and beckoning us and whispering to us and prodding us and walking with us and washing our feet. The idea, again, which we're going to explore in depth is that the three of them, Father, Son, and Spirit, have called you to participate as the fourth. Isn't that crazy? Now, like the little kids game, 
One is clearly not like the other. And we all know that. And that's kind of the beauty for me of being with the Trinity. I know in my knower, as Jeff Klipnitz would say, that I kind of don't fit. And when I mean kind of don't fit, I really don't fit. And yet, I also know in my knower that it's where I belong. And it's that tension that we hold when we're with the Trinity that is so rich. Listen to this high priestly prayer that we just studied recently in John 17. Jesus, right before he's arrested and crucified, is praying to his father. He says, I do not ask, Father, for those only, meaning the disciples that are around him, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, the people that would come, us, that they may be all one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us. See, you hear the fourth? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Wow. That they may be one even as we are one in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you've loved me. Our relationship with him is living and active. He is present. He is attentive. He's listening. He's responding. He's celebrating with your victories and he's mourning in your pain. He is Emmanuel. He is God with you. You have joined in full participation within the life of the Trinity. Spend the rest of your life trying to sort that out and feel that. And second of all, God has now called us into full partnership with him. It's like a father inviting his son to build a fence. My dad always used to have us outside working, partly because my dad hated to be alone. He didn't like to be alone. He was Trinitarian. But also because he wanted us kids to learn and be with him and participate. And it was always a joke between him and my mom because whatever he would call me into to do with him would take him four times as long because I was helping him. And he enjoyed every minute of it. He can do it without us, but he chooses relationally to do it with us. And our participation has real impact and consequence on the redemption of this broken world. John 17, I am them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that, what happens when we join as the fourth, so that, here's what happens, the world sees it, and they know that you sent me, Jesus says, and love them even as you love me. Isn't that cool? You know your witness, you know your greatest effect you have on this world? The greatest part of your, that you play in the the plan of redemption and restoration, the greatest thing is not what you say to other people. It is your full participation with the three of them. And thus with each other. As we participate with each other and with them, we are living out the essence of the Trinity and it washes over this world. Isn't that cool? Let's pray. Father, sitting before me is the royal priesthood, your royal priesthood. Everyone here with a collar on, but not a collar of slavery, but a collar of pure identification with the three of you. May we feel that. May we wear that. May you change how we think as a result of these explanations you've given us. And all God's people said, and step up. Thanks, Doug. You're welcome. Now is our opportunity to ask questions. Perhaps you have a question on your mind from... 
the series over these last four weeks. Maybe it's a comment. It could even be something as you have thought this through or, or put some of these things into practice to hear from Doug. And I, I saw a hand already. I was, and I'm thankful because sometimes when you go to an opportunity for questions, it could get real silent and real awkward. I thought that's why you called me up here. Maybe. Well, if it's going to be awkward, let's get the awkward guy. That's perfect. All right. That's perfect. But I see someone's hand. I know this is a little different, by the way, but it's like Journey upstairs. What if anything changed in the Trinity of Oneness while Jesus walked here below? And then what if anything changed in the Trinity of Oneness to the thought of what Jesus did? Don't remind us of that. It looks like we're out of time. <laughs> You're, let me make, make, see if I understand your question. You're saying, what changed within the Trinity while Jesus was here? And then the second part of your question is, what changed when Jesus returned? And now that the Spirit is available to all of us. What changed? Boy, that's a good question. Really? That's the first question? Um, well... The answer is everything and nothing. There's a Jewish answer. Ellen would be so, so happy with it. I'll start with nothing. Nothing changed because they were still in love. So even though Jesus sets aside, if you will, even though, remember Philippians 2, even though he emptied himself and doesn't grasp onto his divinity and comes to earth, but really what, it, what, we, what we looked at and we saw both in the John series and in, in, I think, week one is that he was actually explaining God to us. This is what God does. So nothing changed because nothing changed between the three of them. Jesus said, I do only what the Father tells me. And he only did what the Spirit empowered him to do, which is still the way it is, I think, personally. But mostly because he emptied himself as a man. So that's really what changed. What changed was Jesus set the scepter aside. And so a third of the Trinity now does not hold rule. And so Jesus lived our life. He lived under the power of the Spirit. So when Jesus has somebody come up to them and they're blind and they say, Son of David, have mercy on me, I think two things took place as a man. He said, Father... Is it your immediate will? I already know your ultimate will. Is it your immediate will to heal this person? And I think the father said, yes. And I think he then said, okay, spirit, would you release your power through me? Because the power comes from God, not from us. And so I think that was different momentarily. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and then when he returns... He, the father hands him the scepter of rule again to make everything right. And so I think Jesus can then act out of his own power because he has not set that aside to become human. And so that's about the best shot I got. And so let me just follow that up. So it sounds like the understanding of God, the spirit is able to no, other than there's a weird nuance in the Old Testament about the Spirit not necessarily being permanently residing. And, and, and now it, he's, the, he's the era bone, he's the engagement ring that, that, that we receive, and he cannot be taken away. Um, that's the only difference. Yeah. But I think Jesus had to live differently. I think he lived differently when he was on earth. Yes. Yes, he was exhausted. And part of his exhaustion was every, if there was a line of a thousand people, I personally believe, and we'll talk about this in July, that every time he said, Father, how about this one? And the Father said, yes. And he said, okay, Spirit, release your power and heal them. The difference between him and me, I say the difference, one of eight million is that he has a better sense of the immediate will of God than I do. I still pray. Anyway. All right, we have another question. 
Good morning, church. Brother Tion. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, thank you. Hi, Doug. Um, one of my prayers today was going to be, how can I not be so busy that I forget about God? And you touched on it a little bit, like, once we leave church, and Monday at noon, we, like, what's going on? Yeah. So what are some practical oh, ways that question. we can implement in our lives? Because I'm working on getting better with staying in yeah. the spirit more longer than... You know, I pray. So that's that's going to be the first sermon I'm going to give in July. But <laughs> but let's go there. Let's go there because it takes us 15 times to get there anyway. Um, what has changed for me in this last five to 10 years is that I don't think of God in an amorphous way. God is no longer a blob to me. It sounds strange, but God is a title. God is not His name. Um, he has lots of names, um, but. But really, he's identified as Father, Son, and Spirit. And so, first of all, the personalization of God has helped me a lot be more aware of him during the day. Rather than just God, he is now Father. He is now Brother. He is now the Spirit that reminds and teaches and encourages and heals and comforts. Kind of the list of things that the Spirit does. And so when I start my day now, I start my day greeting the three of them. And I come at God individually like that, and it's extremely helpful. Now, I was just having a talk with my wife about this because we walked this morning together. And the last thing I want to do is, is add too much complexity to your thought life and your prayer life. But for me, it is personalized God. And so now... As a result, the second piece that takes place is now I feel like I'm a co-participant with the three of them. I'm participating with the Father, I'm participating with the Son, and I'm participating with the Spirit. And then that leads to all kinds of things. Well, what is the Father's role? What is the Son's role? What's the Spirit's role? Because they have very different roles. And so I actually address them uniquely. This is a whole sermon on its own. But I address them uniquely now based upon what their roles are. Um, Jesus was the creator of the three. He's the one that breathed you into existence. He's the one I usually go to for things like physical things and creation. The father, he's the architect. He's the planner. He's the designer. So that's why you see more often than not, the prayers in the Bible are actually to the father, not to the son and not to the spirit. But that's a long-winded answer of saying, I've personalized God more. I've personalized God more, and then I practically bring him into the day, which really, I'm, I'm, I'm inviting him into my life, but really what he's doing is he's inviting me into his. Does that, does that help at all? But I have specific times in the day where I do that. Anybody else? You got another one right here. Okay. And then you got Mike. Uh, good morning. Hey, um, how you So... Doing? I've listened to like all the services that go along with this and I've been in church for quite a while. And my question is, cause this seems like an uncharted territory. Like why? And I guess I'm asking you when you probably don't have the answer necessarily, but why is this kind of a, I guess an unspoken truth that is, this is about the church, I guess. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that's it what right. We talked about, don't you, Greg? Greg and I, Greg sent me an email. It was a really encouraging email, and there was somebody in the church 13 years ago that really had a hard, hard had a hard problem with this series when I did it in Journey. I think maybe it was downstairs. I can't remember. I think I did it in Bowl. And um, and what Greg so beautifully pointed out to this uh, person, who was a very godly person and really knew the word, and I said it earlier when I spoke this morning. We're more comfortable with a God we can kind of define. And, and as Greg said to me, and it's because we want control, I think. When God is suddenly outside the realm of my ability to manipulate and control and define, he's a bit frightening, right? It's, do you remember the, what was the line in the Chronicles of Narnia? Is he, is he good, right? Is What's, yeah, is he safe? And the answer was, oh, he's not safe at all. He's good. 
He is always, always others focused, but he's not safe. If you've been walking with, a, with God for more than an hour, you should know this. I mean, as I just said, he might not remedy your life suffering problem right now because it could be tied to the restoration of humanity. It means he painfully has to watch you suffer. That's terrible for him. It also feels very unsafe, but he's good. And so the problem is when you start blowing up the lines on God, he gets a little frightening. But the problem is you have to bring in his goodness with his undefinability as well. The bigger he gets, the scarier he is unless he's good. If he's for us and his ultimate will is for our prosperity and health, Ultimately, you will all get a better physical body. My poor wife has had the hardest year. She's been riddled with, with um, uh, dizziness, just horrible, horrible dizziness. And her, then she broke her back a few years ago, and her back keeps going out. She's just been in pain, and it's just been not a fun few months, you know? So it's kind of like, God, like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I know his ultimate will is he's going to give her a new body. And I know he has the ability to heal her right now. But he's, he's, he's doing it slowly over time. But then it stops, and it's like, what are you doing? Well, I got to just believe he's good. He's good. There's something else going on. The reason I think we fight that as a church is just a lot for us to take in. Go ahead. All right, I think One we have. More. Do you have time for yes. two? All right, because we'll come back over here to okay. John. I can't believe I'm getting this many questions. I'm really proud of this church. First of all, thanks. Thanks, Doug. Um, I was there you know, like 10 years ago or, or more when yeah. you gave this, and it's really kind of changed the way I interact with God. I appreciate mm. just the essence of your message. But I have a question today about, um, and you just answered part of it when you were talking about your wife and her physical problems, but... Um, been praying for a family member for health for quite some time, and for whatever reason, God has chosen to let that go on for a while. And um, mm. but what are what does He want us to do with the way we feel about that? I mean, it's really His problem, but I, I'm so concerned about Him. It's it's a burden for me to, as I yeah. think about Him. And um, what does He want me to do with that? If, I, I think. Did everybody hear that? A lot, I think we have to hold life in tension because there's, there's almost never one truth taking place. There's many truths taking place. I think you have to hold the, the, the truth that God is capable of healing. I think you have to hold to the truth that God's ultimate will and his immediate will are not necessarily the same. We have to be able to pray like Jesus did. Here's what I want, but I want what you want. Here's what I want, but I want what you want. There's a whole section of a sermon that I wrote yesterday too. Um, I think we have to hold intention that God is good. And so if what I'm seeing does not match that, it, does not, it, it doesn't change the equation. That God is good even though the immediate is not taking place like I want. The second we let go of the goodness of God, we're really in trouble. It's bad enough that God doesn't feel safe all the time, but if God is not good we're hosed, right? So there's at least three things we have to hold in tension. We have to hold in tension also the truth that we do carry the burdens of each other. It's going to feel like a weight. You know, I feel weighted for this church. Now, I'm not saying that as a complaint. It's a beautiful thing that I feel weighted. You know, I, I don't sing a lot of times in the service um, before I preach because I'm honestly praying for you. I feel the weight of... God, of wanting God to intersect with you and meet you and heal and comfort you. It's the same thing you're saying for this individual. That's a beautiful thing. How horrible would it be if we were individuals that were so narcissistic we don't feel empathetically for the weight of others? That's a God-given Trinitarian piece that's inside of you. And so I think you have to hold all of those things simultaneously in tension. Hold just one of them you're going to come up with a wrong conclusion. Does that help? Okay. 
Last one. And Isaac, maybe you make your way up. Yeah. Uh, so kind <laughs> of kind of the same thing what Mike is talking about, but maybe extend a little bit. Uh, I've, I've been praying for something for 25, 30 years. Yeah. And um, how do I know when it's no? <laughs> how do I know <laughs> when I stop praying and I got to uh, stop beating my head up against the wall yeah. for that answer? Well, that's a great question. And there, is a, there is a time to stop. And we know that because Paul stopped. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, he called it. And God met him and said, I'm not taking it away. And Paul, at least as we know it, it does, he doesn't say, I stopped praying it, but he says, I prayed three times. He never mentions a fourth. I think there is a time when we just say, I relent to you. But there are other times when I think it involves particularly somebody else's decision. Because sometimes we're praying for something like a physical healing. And sometimes we're praying for somebody else's own mindset and decision. And, and God is saying, look, I'm not going to cross the boundary with them. I'm not going to force myself on them. That's not who I am. I'm a gentleman. But it doesn't mean I'm not going to keep praying until the day I die for that individual, that God will keep bringing things in their life to bring them to their knees or to come to a better realization. So I, I, I don't have an answer to your question other than you just need to keep feeling for the heart of God in that. And sometimes I think, sometimes we're fighting God and I think we just need to let go. When we prayed with Diane Copeland, she told us two things. She said, before we start, I want you to know two things. She said, I feel loved. And then she said something amazing. It was Jesus in Gethsemane. She said, and I'm comfortable with whatever God does. Wow. She said, heal it now, don't heal it, heal it partially, heal it slowly, heal it through a surgeon, heal it by touching it and praying for it. I'm, I'm, I'm good with whatever God does. Before we ever prayed, that's a great posture to be in. So I think your posture, you can sort out for yourself, you know, God, should I, should I still be asking this or not? And then part of the posture is, are we okay with the phrase, thy will be done? knowing that his immediate will doesn't always match his ultimate will. Ultimately, he wants every human being to know him. It's not going to happen. Isn't that crazy? Anyway, let's, um, let's pray and just sing to God. Father, thank you for the honesty of this place, the humility of this place. We are quite small as you know, quite broken and weak and so in need of you. So in need of you, it's shocking we forget. But we do. It's part of our weakness. Thank you that you never stop folding yourself around us and watching over us, covering us with the pinions of your wings best we can as we sing to you now.